and we're going to ask uh, Quinn Dolan if she could be able to do the introduction. This is a program I've been looking forward to. This is great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Quinn, for coordinating this. This is a program I've been looking for for a long time. And so, uh, Quinn, if you could be able to give us your introduction of the program. Thank you, President Eric. It's my great pleasure to introduce two incredibly accomplished and dynamic women. These women are truly trailblazers. Justice Mary Yu was appointed to the Washington State Supreme Court in 2014. Prior, prior to her appointment, she handled both criminal and civil matters as a King County Deputy Prosecuting Attorney. When she be, officially became Justice Yu on the Supreme Court of Washington, she became the first woman of color. She is both Asian and Latinx descent and first member of the LGBTQ to serve as a Supreme Court Justice. Justice Helen Whitener was recently appointed to the Washington State Supreme Court this year after previously serving as a Pierce County Superior Court judge who practiced criminal law both as a prosecutor and a defense attorney before her appointment to the Pierce County bench. When she was appointed to the Supreme Court, she was the first black woman to serve on the Supreme Court and as the first openly black LGBTQ judge in all of Washington State. Justice Whitner is from Trinidad originally, a country where being gay was punishable by five to 25 years in prison until as recently as 2018 when they changed the law. These two justices serve as co-chairs of the Minority and Justice Commission. Justice Whitner brought Color of Justice, a program to encourage young people to uh, become judges of color to Washington State. And when we brought Color of Justice here to Yakima County, Justice Yu was our keynote speaker. I don't think they are Rotarians, but they are certainly dedicated to service above self through their role as justices and their dedication to equity issues and access to justice. They will share more about their letter on racism and their lead on co the COVID response, but I will share my favorite part of the letter and try not to tear up. As judges, we must recognize the role we have played in devaluing black lives. This very court once held that a cemetery could law Hopefully deny grieving black parents the right to bury their infant. We cannot undo this wrong, but we can recognize our ability to do better in the future. And I will also add that as someone who is practicing law during a pandemic, the Supreme Court's guidance during this pandemic has been potentially life-saving. Nothing was happening in Yakima County Courts until the Supreme Court issued an order continuing cases and setting forth guidance to keep both attorneys and clients safe. So I am incredibly indebted to them. And it is my, as I said, my deep pleasure to introduce both of them. You are all in for a treat. Thank you both for coming and speaking. Okay. Thank you, Quinn. I'm looking for Justice Whitener only because I want to get some visual clues to make sure uh, that I'm not going to be speaking over her, that I'm going to defer to her. Uh, as much as I can today. So I'm searching for her on the multitude. There we are. There's Justice Whitener. So let me first of all say uh, thank you, Quinn, for the invitation. Um, I love coming to Yakima. And uh, whenever there's an opportunity to somehow be present with you, you know I'm going to accept that invitation. Um, so thank you very, very much. Yakima is always very special. One of the things that I uh, thought of was um, I wanted to bring somebody who is very special, who you already have introduced, because our court um, has gone through a radical shift over the last couple of years in many ways, new voices coming on. Um, and I would say probably the most important feature or two important features is the large presence of trial judges now on the Supreme Court. It makes a difference when we have judges who understand what has happened uh, in the trenches as a trial lawyer, but in my view, as a trial judge. Someone who's had to make very, very tough decisions about evidence, uh, about guilt or innocence, uh, but really somebody who understands what is going on in our courts. So I was so pleased when we had Justice Raquel Montoya Lewis join us as the first Native American uh, justice. And then, of course, I was completely thrilled that my colleague and dear friend, uh, Justice Helen Whitener, uh, when she joined us on the court for so many different reasons. Obviously, we are a diverse court with different views, but now we are a diverse court with different backgrounds. 
Uh, Justice Whitener is not only experienced as a trial judge, but in my view, I have to admit, and I'm sorry to embarrass you a little bit, Justice Whitener, she's wise. Um, she's truly wise and she has courage and she's never been afraid to uh, speak her mind whenever the situation calls for it. Um, I'm so happy that she's on our court because uh, of the way that we make decisions, right? It's nine individuals discussing cases and trying to come up with the best resolution possible. Like all of you, we are struggling right now in so many ways. Uh, we haven't been together in a room discussing cases. We haven't been in our courtroom hearing oral argument. I've not been able to wholly embrace my sister, Justice Helen Whitener, uh, as a colleague in the way that I would have wanted to. Um, I believe this time will pass and we will have that time uh, to come together. Uh, but our court, again, is busy. Uh, Quinn mentioned two things. Uh, one has been uh, our supervision over the court's response to this terrible COVID-19 and trying to provide direction to our courts. But also there's another historical moment uh, and we stepped right up and that is to address the problem uh, of racism, institutional racism and our role uh, in sometimes not doing a single thing about it and other times doing it uh, in a manner that has failed. Uh, the best thing about our court is our court embraced the opportunity uh, to challenge every lawyer and to challenge every single judge to assume the responsibility for making it better. So um, I have much to say and we will answer any question that you have about COVID as well as our letter, but I wanna provide an opportunity for Justice Whitener to extend her greetings and to make a few remarks because I'm just so thrilled that she's with us and that she's with me today. Well, hello, Yakima, or how do you pronounce it? Rotarians, I heard everyone say, so hello, Yakima Rotarians. Thank you so much for the invitation, Justice Yu, and thank you to the Rotarians for inviting me this morning to just chat briefly. I actually wrote a little thing in regards to the COVID-19 situation, so you'll have um, some background as to what the courts have been doing. As you know, the mission of the Washington courts is to protect the liberties guaranteed by the Constitution and laws mm -hmm. of the state of Washington and the United States. Impartial, impartially uphold and interpret the law and provide open, just, and timely resolution of all matters. We also strive to provide open access to our proceedings. Needless to say, the COVID-19 pandemic has challenged our courts in how we operate and in how we provide critical justice services to all who need them. Courts provide essential services, and we have been working diligently to try and remain open and accessible to ensure access to justice remains of great import. Protection orders, urgent disputes, family law matters, and criminal matters, matters of civil rights continue to be addressed. Many courts have been operating remotely, utilizing telephone, video conferencing, emails, and web-based communications. Things we used before but I can tell you never on a level as has been required since the pandemic. The judicial branch has been working collaboratively with the other branches of government, our chief justice has, and the statewide response effort. The Supreme Court in April began operating remotely through Zoom and the hearings are live streamed by TVW. That's pretty important for me because I started on this bench April 24th. And as you've heard from Justice Yu, I have yet to sit on the bench in person with my colleagues. So I believe I've just made history as well as the first virtual Supreme Court justice. <laughs> now you see me, hopefully that's, that means you'll see me again in person at some point in time. But right now, everything has been virtual. I'm actually at home right now in one of my rooms working remotely um, since the court is closed. Open and transparent is, is very important to the courts, maintaining the courts and the public's trust and confidence that you've placed in us. But most importantly, through this pandemic, being healthy and safety and safe is important. And not just for those of us who work within the court system, but those of you who utilize the services of the court. It is paramount to us that we remain safe 
and that you and us remain healthy. So in other words, your courts are trying to utilize technology as best as it can in moving forward. We do have limitations in regards to funding. We have realized just how much our courts are in need as we are working with archaic, um, in archaic locations. Our buildings are um, ancient in some respects, but we're doing our best. And at the end of the day, all I can say is your judicial officers are trying really hard to maintain the court as well as make sure that it is accessible to all because access to justice is paramount to us. It is truly wonderful to be here with you this, this noon hour. And as Justice Yu has indicated, the court, by issuing its letter in regards to the recent events of racism, was something I had never seen before. And by that I mean, I have never seen a court give such a directive before. I have lived through racism, but I have just never seen the judiciary take such a strong stance. And it really made me feel welcome especially since I was welcome in this virtual world. That was not virtual, that was truly real. So thank you again for having us this morning. You know, one of the things that I just would uh, like to mention is what's so unique in terms of the COVID matter. And I think, um, you know, we had Quinn mention that nothing was happening until the Supreme Court stepped in. And that's because all of our courts, right, are independent in the sense that we're not a unified court system like some states where you really have the chief who really is at the top and directs down uh, anything. And here there are 39 counties and everybody is pretty independent. Each municipal court and district court and superior court pretty much are independent. Uh, and so the chief is really the figurehead uh, in the state of Washington. And what is remarkable and what I think is historical is that the court ended up stepping in and providing guidance in a way that no one ever thought uh, they'd see in, in our lifetime. And every trial court looked to the Supreme Court voluntarily to say, please give us guidance and tell us what to do. Do we suspend trials? Do we go forward? Can we actually go ahead and hold trials in a virtual manner? Is it permissible? What do we do about criminal trials and the right to go to trial within a certain time frame when we can't even begin to convene people? And the court stepped in and assumed authority simply because trial courts wanted us to step in and say something. No statute was changed, no court rule was changed. The chief has the same level of authority that she did the day before. But what we have for the first time is the court acting as one. It's almost as if we're in a rowboat together, rowing in the same direction with a lot of different players, but there's harmony, there's uniformity, there's a sense of that we have to move forward as best as we can in light of public health concerns. So it's a new role for the court that hasn't been seen before. Um, I'm hoping that this provides us with some tools and perhaps some learning lessons about how we might work collaboratively in the future. It matters to us uh, that our judicial officers and our staff are safe, but it also matters to us more importantly, right, that members of the public who come into our courthouses will be safe. So the guidance that we have provided have been provided through what we call general orders. And that is an order that is issued outlining some of these principles, what's permissible, what's not permissible. Um, and it just gave trial courts permission to go ahead and act on the authority that they already had. Um, it's remarkable. And I would say probably the best thing about it is that we have everybody talking to each other from Spokane to Seattle, from Yakima to Vancouver, is trial judges are collaborating and working together and sharing information about how they're doing their business in light of COVID-19. The date that is unique that's coming up uh, is July 6th. And that's because our order, the last order that our court issued indicated that that's when trial courts would resume having jury trials. That's around the corner. So we're still in a tentative mode, wondering whether or not jurors will respond to a summons. Uh, we would certainly look to Rotarians across the state to say if it's possible to remind people about how important it is to serve if you're called. 
obviously, we want to protect individuals. We're doing everything we can to make sure that there are social distancing practices, that there will be masks available. We're going to do everything we can possibly do, but we can't guarantee. But we do everything we can to try to ensure that it's going to be a safe environment when people come. And we're going to need your help in communicating how important it is to protect a person's right to go to trial. You can't keep people incarcerated forever when they're waiting for a trial. The second that I'll just make some brief comments on, and then again, I'm going to turn to Justice Whitener uh, to add anything, is the letter that we issued. Um, I think, uh, as everybody has recognized already, it is historic. It's historic that the court opted uh, to intervene and not to just write to the general public, right? We felt that we wanted to write to the individuals um, who have a special responsibility in society, and that is lawyers and judges. We bear responsibility for the system that's not perfect. In fact, a system that perhaps has been unjust and unfair, in particular to Black men. We have a responsibility to ask hard questions. We have a responsibility to fix the systemic problems rather than just push it off as somebody else's problem. And I think as judges, we have tended to say, well, I'm the last stop. And so I really have no responsibility for what happens outside of my courtroom. Well, that's not true. Our whole system of justice works together. We are partners with every single entity in the criminal justice system. We are the ones who can convene people at a table to look at our practices, to ask how we conduct bail hearings. Why is it we make a decision on release, not release? Is it a rational decision or not? We are the ones who can convene and move in a different direction. And the call that our letter issued uh, to judges is one that we intend to follow up on. We believe that we can make a difference and we believe that the time is now. So Justice Whitener, I'm gonna turn this over to you. Uh, to share any other remarks. Um, and then maybe at some point we'll open it up for questions from anybody. Well, I think there's very little I can add because Justice, you summed it up so well. But I always live by three Ds and I ask you to consider them as you move forward on this subject. And that is be visible for those who can't see and can't speak, be vocal for those that can't speak, can't stand for themselves, and be vigilant about it. So take a stance and support equality for all in all its forms. We have differences, I always say, but we're not truly different. So be vocal, be visible, and be vigilant. Thank you. Wow, what a beautiful, beautiful. Thank you very much, Justices. I, this was a very highlight of my whole year right here to be able to have this program. I just want to let you know that we're making a donation in your names to uh, polio for eradication of polio. And once again, we thank you very much. And now we'll open it up for questions. So if you wanna go ahead and unmute yourself and be able to ask a question for either one of the justices, uh, this is great, thank you. So oh, hi, my name's Kelly and I have a question for both of you. Um, my husband is an attorney and we've often been talking about what it might be in the courtroom like to actually try to get jurors to come and attend. And so I'm sure that's probably one of the biggest challenges is how, uh, how, or is it even possible to contemplate how we can encourage people to do their civic responsibility and, and you know, have the courage to be a juror during this time? Well, you know, uh, that's the question that we're wrestling with in a sense that some courts have recognized that they can't do this in their courtrooms. And so some have rented space that would allow for jurors to be spaced out and for lawyers to put the case on. Believe it or not, people are having to ask questions such as, is everyone required to have a facial covering? How can a witness testify with a facial covering? Well, they wouldn't, right? We would have to install a plexiglass. We would have to make sure that it's cleaned after each witness. We want to make sure uh, that jurors come in every day, right? And if they don't have the proper equipment, such as facial covering, or perhaps even some sort of sanitar sanitary uh, towels or anything that they might need, the court's going to have to provide that. Um, so the only thing that we can do is take this one step at a time 
And the first step is beginning to say, remember, there is a right to a jury trial in the state of Washington, and we need you to help us through the process. The second, and it falls back on us, is creating a space that allows for the safety of others if we're going to gather people. Um, we will abide by public health guidelines. And if it cannot be done, it won't be done. But I think that you're gonna have this court put in 100% effort and to ask our trial courts to do the same. Uh, our chief has been able to secure uh, masks or facial coverings uh, in a significant in numbers such that we will be able to provide those to jurors once that gets going uh, in every single county. That's not enough and we know that. Uh, we know that there will be people who will simply be afraid and we're gonna have to provide guidance to some of our judges about how it is that you might excuse individuals. Um, we don't want people to be at risk. We don't want people to be anxious in a way that doesn't allow them to pay attention to the evidence. So is it gonna to be tough? Absolutely. Perhaps we'll do jury selection using Zoom. Um, which is another option. Why should people have to come down for jury selection? It might be that this is how it occurs. And then once jurors are selected, that then those are the individuals who might come down uh, to a courtroom or to another space that would allow again for social distancing. This is all an experiment. We're just gonna keep trying to see when we can do it. Other questions? Justice White, I didn't know if you wanted to add anything to that. No, just coming from the trial court myself and um, coming to the Supreme Court in the middle of the transition, all the things that you've covered, um, we have been wrestling with. Um, our courtrooms are too small to socially distance six feet apart. Um, what do you do with a juror who does not want to wear a face mask? Or what do you do with an attorney that doesn't want to wear a face mask? Um, these are some of the questions that the trial level courts are wrestling with. Um, how do you secure a defendant's constitutional right to a speedy trial? When you have these issues coming up, are you even going to be able to impanel a full jury to hear the case? Should we have 12 or can we have less than? So, um, these are unprecedented times and the trial level courts are struggling to come to some sort of consensus and, so, um, and figure out some solutions. And hopefully everyone will be patient with the court as we try and work through these. If I may, um, Charlie, Charlie Robin here. I'm the CEO of the Capitol Theater, one of the larger venues for gathering people in our community. And in working with my colleagues uh, from the West Side, I, I understand that some of them are also looking at being the resource to the courts so that the larger gathering space that we are, which we can't necessarily use in a phase two, phase three option for what we traditionally do, uh, are becoming some of the options uh, for gathering the large pools of jurors to get through the process or even doing a court within the you know, structure of a theater where you can space out, you know, and, and really thinking outside the box about how, you know, in this transition for us, we're still able to be a, a support to the community. And I, I've been really intrigued by how the, the courts have been looking that far afield uh, in their approach. And that is so true. I know in Pierce County, where I came from, we were looking at the convention center because you have to find a large enough location to socially distance. So, um, it's glad, you know, I'm happy to hear that you're also doing some of that over there in Yakima. Yeah. I'm hoping to. <laughs> I was going to say, we ought to encourage it. We ought to encourage our judges to reach out uh, to theaters. I love the idea. I think it's great. Yeah. And a great example in Tacoma. Yeah. Thank you. It would be the prettiest courtroom I've ever practiced law in, Charlie. <laughs> Charlie, <laughs> Charlie, Judge Elizabeth Tooch is on the is on this um, rotary call, so I'm hoping that uh, she has that message, and maybe the two of you can talk about that. Happily. Oh, hi, Judge Pinnell. <laughs> hi, Justice Wine. It's so good to see you. Yeah, nice to see you too. <laughs> and you know, I have to say that Judge Pinnell and the Court of Appeals have been remarkable. Um, they have not missed a beat in doing everything they can to continue to hear cases. 
again, under the same level of stress uh, that we are in the sense of utilizing tools that we weren't comfortable with and trying to figure it out and trying to make sure that lawyers have the right to have oral argument if they wish at the end of the day. So um, thank you, Judge Pinnell, for everything that you're doing. Thank you. I'm really hoping that good things can come from bad. I know that some attorneys from Yakima, it's been difficult in the past for them to argue cases in Spokane, but now we're going to have more flexibility and I'm hoping going forward permanently, more options for people to appear in our courts more easily and less expensively. Other questions? I'm curious to know if, um, if you've had time uh, to generate the health questions, the preliminary questions of a juror um, that could potentially be very tricky to uh, have those up front as someone who has uh, experienced uh, participating on a, on a jury at least four times in my life. Um, I'm now curious about what kind of preliminary health questions would be generated. And we actually do go ahead, have go ahead. Well, go ahead, Justice Whitener. I would think as um, if I'm thinking like a trial level court judge, that it would be similar to dealing with sensitive issues that we normally would deal with on trials in that there will be individual, either a questionnaire or individual questioning. Um, it is not something I think would be appropriate to be discussed in with the whole veneer um, so it might be done by way of a short questionnaire where the juror can indicate specifically what their basis is for being or making a request to be excused, or it can be done by individual questioning um, outside the presence of the full veneer because we are dealing with health, health questions, health issues, health yeah. information, and there's that privacy issue there. But it's similar to dealing with a uh, sex case where there are privacy issues there as well. So um, I could see the trial level court handling those matters, at least in a similar manner going forward. And what the, uh, we have a task force, a statewide task force made up of trial judges uh, that are really working through each of the phases of a trial and trying to provide a booklet for every single court. And one of the things in the booklet is write a sample set of questions that you might ask and we hope that perhaps it would even be uh, available before a person even comes down so that they might log in once they get a summons onto the court's website answer the questions and then automatically perhaps be excused or have that jury service postponed because of the way some of the questions were answered it would be private it would allow somebody to be honest in terms of how uh, they felt or perhaps what conditions they might have that would put them at risk. Um, so they are coming up with, again, a uniform set of questions that would assist any trial judge on how to go ahead and ask questions uh, in regard to jury service. I didn't know that. That's, that's really good to know. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. <clears throat> Other questions? Uh, I have a question. Uh, uh, my name is John Ball. And uh, this is segueing a little bit from, um, from the time of COVID to the time when COVID is, is just a bad memory. But um, I'd like to segue a little bit to the other um, part that we started talking about, which is the letter and the uh, transcript of your interview. And um, some of the things that I kind of struggle with is, and this may be a naive, really naive question, but you know, among us who are here on this particular call and or Zoom or whatever we call it, um, you know, we talk about the issues of racial justice and and um, and trying to move beyond the whole uh, area of systemic racism. But as an individual um, person who kind of lives in, to a certain extent, we kind of live in a bubble of our own little world right now. What are, do you have any kind of ideas or things that you've seen or thought about or talked about that, that would help um, individuals like me to do more than just, you know, be a lip service to, you know, um, <clears throat> yeah, yeah, we have to get beyond racial justice, all right, or racial profiling. Um, what, what, I'm not a police officer, I'm not a judge, I'm not a lawyer, um, I'm just kind of a, 
nonprofit, old, retired, has been museum director. <laughs> In my view, I think it's not only the personal conversations that have to happen and which are probably the most difficult is challenging somebody, right, who has a different view, but having the courage to do it is probably one of the biggest things that we can do. But second, and I believe in economic power, and that's because I came from a very disadvantaged family as a young person. And I understand what economic power is and the access that it provides. So I would encourage each of you Support black businesses. Go to black businesses, buy your groceries, buy what you need, shift that money into businesses in your community that could use your support uh, because that's real and that will make all the difference in terms of bridging the divide but empowering somebody else who's trying to do good, who's trying to succeed uh, and to support their family. That is one concrete way. Um, that I think it will make a huge difference. That doesn't address some of the systemic underlying racism, but it is something that is very real and will make a difference uh, in your community because many black businesses are struggling to survive, especially during this crisis right now, right? When nobody is going out anywhere. Uh, but now that we're beginning to open up in some places, I think really the purchase power is so important. Well, I think- Thank you. you if I can answer that question as well, it is calling it out when you see it. Um, things that would be said to someone like me would probably not be said to my face. It would be said in your circle. And if you let it go, then at some point in time, it would be said to me. Um, many of us have been having uh, training on implicit bias, which basically makes us aware of our unconscious bias. And all of us have it. The thing is, when I teach about implicit and explicit bias, I ask one question and I'll ask you the question. What is the difference between implicit and explicit bias to the receiver? And when you think about it, you realize there is no difference. Because implicit bias is your unconscious bias and it's only implicit to you. For me to know about it means you have manifested your implicit bias. So therefore it has always been explicit to the receiver. So when you see it, you call it out. And um, that's one way I think people who are from a different background um, can help. You don't have to be a judge, a lawyer, um, or any special person. Mr. Ball, is it? John Ball? I hope I pronounced your uh, name John. right. I think, sir, just you asking that question says a lot. And mm -hmm. that's the type of conversation that needs to occur. So I thank you for asking that. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. President, do we have time for one more question? Sure. Uh, justices, my name is Tim Carlson. I am a lawyer. Uh, as you can tell, I'm a little older and I have spent most of my career practicing in the insolvency area. And unfortunately, one of the topics we're not talking about is the aftermath of COVID. And shall we say the subsequent results to the programs that have been supporting so many businesses. Mm -hmm. I'm definitely seeing that effect already quite sadly with regard to established businesses here in our town, uh, to you know industries that we hold very near and dear. And obviously the New York Times did a recent article about the agricultural business and the impact that were, were being had with regard to COVID. I'm curious and I wouldn't, certainly wouldn't <laughs> blame the court for not focusing on the receivership aspect, but one of our great tools is to use the state court receivership law, which Judge Baraka brought to us a uh, very, a, a, a great law that gives us a, a, a reasonable alternative and frankly, a much cheaper administrative alternative to uh, the bankruptcy system, which is federal for those who don't know. Um, has the court looked ahead and is the court at this point moving toward a readoption of rule 66, which is receivership in the sense that it enables better um, access to the courts for the emergencies, especially that occur in financial insolvency. And um, I'm just curious as to what the 
level of interest or impact might be at this point, either for the Supreme Court and or for um, it, especially the lower courts, the Superior Court were, you know, were involved in those particular proceedings. Uh, any comments you feel you could make would be greatly appreciated. You know, I have to say that when you say to readopt or adopt Rule 66, is it that, is it, I guess I'm just wondering why would you say readoption? Is it not being utilized? Is it not, is receivership not being utilized by lawyers in our system? Definitely being utilized, Your Honor. I, I'm sorry, the, 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 the question really is that the statute was intended to largely to replace what is obviously an equitable remedy, which is uh, receivership. But, but Rule 66 sort of uh, went by the way, and, and quite frankly, it wasn't very detailed at the time and didn't provide courtroom access uh, on a priority basis. And I, I am concerned about that because obviously our courts are very burdened with a number of things that are very, very important. But equally important is, is the access because as we, as we deal with racism, as we deal with um, issues of, of illness that are, are going to uh, fall out of this, and frankly, unemployment, um, being able to support those businesses and keep, you know, 20, 40 employee businesses uh, afloat, if you will, uh, over the, the difficulties that you get from lenders and, and, and people who have legitimate interests, don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to be, I'm not trying to in any way uh, cast dispersions there. Um, it, it really does require us to be able to get there. And fortunately, our, our, our trial judges are very sensitive to it. But as you move up the administrative uh, area, it, it's very difficult to get the administrative uh, attention to it. Um, and if it were communicated by rule, I, I think, or other directive from the court, whether it be a GR or whatever. I, I'm not meaning to get too technical in the meeting, but it's, a, it's an area, obviously, of great concern to me because of the uh, impact that I see on, on real human beings of, of every type. I, um, I mean, it doesn't matter. Uh, I'm a 300 pound man. So, you know, I got, I've got a kind of an idea that, that people are impacted by the way implicit, if you will, bias. Um, and, and economic bias is a, is, a, is a very difficult thing to witness. And so I'm, I'm hopeful that the court, you know, could but take a look at that, and and um, maybe it's not on the on the radar screen. I wouldn't blame you, but it, again, it's a very effective tool, and the more we can help with that, um, you know, it'd be great. Timothy, what I'm going to ask you to do, if you wouldn't mind, because you're a lawyer, would you send me an email as a follow up to this? I and sure, because, truly, me, Your Honor. <laughs> Justice Wagner and I are starting a series of meetings with trial judges. Uh, and raising a lot of different questions about how we're going to pivot in different directions to respond to some of the challenges that the court has issued. Um, I also sit on the rules committee, so I would be very interested in something more from you that would help me better understand a path to take. Um, because anything that we could utilize to get past this, um, I can tell you there is openness. Absolutely, there's openness. Well, I, I'm sure there is. Sometimes it's hard to have awareness when we want to have it. And, and, and so ordered and so done, Your Honor. <laughs> Thank you. Justice well, I really appreciate you. I really appreciate you, uh, Justices, for being able to be on this call um, and this Zoom meeting because it really means a lot. And also to let you know that uh, uh, this is program, you know, this is great because not only do we get to see it now, but we get to digest it on, on uh, YouTube and as well as on our Facebook page, as well as on our website, so people can be able to do that. And I encourage our Rotarians to make sure that you share this program because this, this means a lot. I look forward to being able to have more conversations with you. Uh, wow, Justice, you, you guys are great. <laughs>